Greetings, Guardians. My name is Byf here. It may be a few days late, but we're going to go ahead and take a look at the Witch Queen trailer for Savathun's Throne World and break it down and talk about all the important little lore snippets that are sort of shown to us in this trailer, give a little bit of analysis here and there, do all the good usual stuff. This is recorded live without a script, so if you hear the occasional dog barking, that's just life going on outside and potentially inside the house. And then, of course, also, it just means that I'm doing all of this stuff here and, uh, you know, I'm not particularly keeping to a script. So you're going to get the more casual version of Bife that sometimes you get in my videos such as these. But before we get into that, I really wanted to let you know that this video is brought to you by Manscaped. Fellas, it's 2022. Whilst not everything this year has started out perfectly, I think we can all agree that a new year presents a chance for a presentable new you. For someone special in your life, maybe, that you might be trying to impress, when it finally does get down to that moment in time where you've really got to perform, you've got to have something in mind. Hygiene. Let's not beat around the bush, fellas. Grooming is important, and if you want to keep your other half happy, then you should go ahead and check out the Performance Package 4.0 from Manscaped. As a happily married man, I will tell you, it is important. My wife appreciates it. I appreciate the products in here too. The Performance Package 4.0 comes with a full suite of tools designed specifically for all your male grooming needs. It comes with the excellent Lawn Mower 4.0 trimmer with advanced skin safe technology to reduce nicks and cuts in the most sensitive parts of your body, and trust me, you don't want cuts there, that's bad. It's an excellent rechargeable and waterproof razor, which means you can just go ahead and use it in the shower, which is nice, no mess, pretty easy to use, and what's more, you can just go ahead and leave it there when you're done. It even has a cool travel lock feature, which means that if you're going to go over somewhere for a trip for the night, you can take it with you. Nice and easy. But remember, gents, hygiene isn't just a front and center game when it comes to all of that mess in the jungle. It's also about down low in the nads and the smell. Again, hygiene is important, and when it comes down there, let's not beat around the bush. It's not a great smell. For that, you're going to want this. The Crop Preserver and Crop Reviver for your man bits. Because you know what? It never hurt for your nether regions to be a little less sweaty and gross. And trust me, your future partner will thank you. Believe me on that one. The Crop Preserver is an all-day source of odor protection for use after your morning shower, and the Crop Reviver is a simple, convenient spritz that can be used just to top things off where you need it. Lastly, but not least, there's also this. The Weed Whacker, convenient little nose and ear trimmer. You know, handy for trimming the harder to reach places on your body. There's never been a better time to invest in yourself, and in order to go ahead and make the best impression in the time when it counts the most, go ahead and make sure that your grooming is up to snuff. Go ahead and grab yourself the Performance Package 4.0, and right now it'll mean that you'll get the biggest bang for your buck too. You get two extra free gifts, a pair of boxes and a travel bag, specifically from Manscaped, whenever you go ahead and order it. But keep in mind, that's for a limited time only, so grab that really quickly while you can. And if you do try Manscaped and you do love it, you can go ahead and sign up with their Peak Hygiene Plan, which means that you'll get replacement products at regular intervals delivered straight to your door. Start the new year off right and head to manscaped.com to get 20% off and free international shipping, plus the two free gifts that I mentioned earlier when you use promo code BIFE20 at checkout. Thanks again to Manscaped for sponsoring this video. Anyway, let's go ahead and start talking. The very first thing we want to talk about, I think, is actually in this first frame here, and that is the pyramid ship itself. The pyramid ship is a thing within Savathun's throne world, and that's interesting for a whole bunch of reasons. We're not entirely sure why it's here, but it's possible that it is invasive and is a manifestation of the darkness that is trying to take out Savathun as well. This may be something that is a bigger part in the plot, and honestly, considering the way that things have been teased in the season of The Lost, I think that it's more than likely. Also, for those of you who are wondering, this is where the raid will take place, and that's information that is publicly available on Bungie.net, so no spoilers here. By the way, if somehow you wanted to stay unspoiled of the trailer, wh wh why are you watching this video? Like, I'm br I break it down in the title for you, like I say I'm gonna analyze the trailer, like... Anyway, yeah, anything you see in this trailer, uh, consider it no longer spoilers, because lo and behold, it's been released to the public and it's a trailer. All things considered, this is going to make for a really interesting raid location, and it's something that Evan and I talked about on our podcast a few days ago, 
um, where we basically just sat down and talked about our predictions for Witch Queen. It makes me wonder whether Savathun will actually be the raid boss at all, and honestly, I am veering hard towards no. I've been veering hard towards no ever since I found out about the Pyramid Ship, and I feel like that's the kind of expectation we should temper ourselves to. I think that Savathun is a villain that will point and pivot us towards the bigger manifestation of darkness that exists here in the throne world in the form of this pyramid ship. Anyway, with that first frame out of the way, let's go ahead and take a look at everything else and start breaking it down. Guardian? Guardian, do you read me? Okay, so first thing I want to go ahead and break down immediately before we get into anything. This white light here with kind of black shadow around it, something that clearly, as you can see with the Guardian holding their ghost out, you can either interact with or it's something that is indicated will be important for story purposes. There is a frame I want to reference ahead in the trailer right now, and it's this one here with this Titan, who has a similar kind of white glow above his forehead there before starting to jump on what appears to be hidden platforms. This looks like the kind of tincture of Queen's Foil mechanic and Toland from the Dreaming City and the Moon rolled into one. This is something that they interact with in the world here, in the Throne world, so I mean clearly there's something going on there. I think it's definitely one of these moments at which we're seeing a greater presence within Savathun's throne world that we need to uncover, especially considering that all of this is given the preface with Expose Her Lies. By the way, for those of you who haven't looked at these symbols, they do indeed translate to different things throughout the trailer, and they're certain elements. I have a theory about that, but that might be another video if you guys want me to cover that. You can go ahead and let me know down below in the comments section. But for context, this one I believe is the chemical... Uh, formulation for osmium, a material that is so hard that it is actually brittle, if I'm remembering everything correctly. I'm not a chemist. I'm not a scientist. So I, I do not consider myself somewhat of a scientist. So don't take my word on that one. Anyway, the point is, look around for these in the throne world. There will probably either be some kind of secret and jumping puzzle as was displayed later in the trailer with this, or alternatively you're going to be looking at something which is a little bit simpler, I think. Something where it'll just be about exploring the story. It might even be like the Tolan patrols on the moon. Let's continue. Do you read me? We're here, Ikora. What is this place? So, big look at the upper echelons of the throne world itself. Oh my goodness. Uh, I know we made commentary on this again in the podcast that Evan and I hosted, but wow, it's such a wonderful Dark Souls-y aesthetic. It's like Dark Souls in the Dreaming City and the Dreadnought married and had triplets or something. This is fantastic. I love the aesthetic of all of this. But also, there is something to point out here, which is that if you've looked at other Hive throne worlds, you will notice that this is a very different kind of appearance. It is alabaster white as opposed to the typical Hive grey, which is still on the tomb ships here that you can see. And there's things growing here. There are plants and flowers and gardens, especially in this upper echelon, and I think that this is communicative of Savathun and her brood transitioning from a people that relies purely on darkness and death and the sword logic to a people that rely on the light. And this is expressed by the fact that life, in many complex and perhaps not sword logic prone forms, is allowed to thrive within their throne world. This may also be the reason why at the very beginning we see the swamps of Savathun's throne world that are just allowed to run rampant and have all these trees all over the place. So it's a real question as to what's going on there, but these upper echelon areas of the throne world being like this, I think is a direct reflection of Savathun and her brood having adopted the light. Of course, in this shot here, we also see a bunch of the other locations we get to go through. We'll talk about them as we go. For the moment though, yeah, uh, expect this to be an area where you're much more likely to encounter Hive Guardians and those who are indeed more attuned to the light. We're in the domain of the God of Cunning. So yeah, where do we begin? This kind of area down here shows that the Hive have not completely abandoned their past. I also want to go back and sort of illustrate a few things here. 
Areas like this remind me a lot of the Dreadnought. These kind of chains and these odd cylindrical structures here on the walls remind me in particular of the Hanging Crypts, which was an area back in the Dreadnought which essentially acted as a jail for Oryx and his hive that had effectively decided to turn and fight against him. This was in a location where, in particular, you could find the Dark Blade. Alakul, who was a very famous strike boss from Destiny 2, the Taken King. Destiny 2, the Taken King? Wow, that's wishful thinking. Destiny, the Taken King. Goodness gracious. Anyway, point is, something like this, down in the dark, especially when you have a hive brood that has decided to turn to the light, might be indicative of something very similar. Alternatively, seeing as we do see a thrall, what I presume is a thrall here, starting to go ahead and chew away at some bones and whatnot, you're probably looking at something that is more akin to an undercity, something that maybe has the purpose of spawning pits, and is generally not very nice. Think the bottom of the Hellmouth for something very similar, but of course with the same kind of alabaster accenting and whatnot. I think this will be an entire area, and I think also that it's going to be vaguely tied into this location here, because this, again, keeps a lot of the same trappings, but it looks like it is deep underground. That darkness is very much there. And also, considering that hive structures, generally speaking, contain important things near the bottom of the structure, this might be something that is important too. I don't know if this is exactly going to be where Savathun's throne is, but it's definitely going to be something that holds or leads to something important. I would say that maybe your best guess is a repository of information or something that will help to unravel Savathun's lies. That's just a guess though, and as many people will understand, this is all speculative, so don't take my word for everything. Things are never what they seem. Really quickly, by the way, that is terrifying and really cool and most definitely will be part of a puzzle during something, maybe in the campaign, maybe later. But again, it makes me think that these kind of lower areas are going to play host to something. I don't know, maybe a dungeon. That would be really interesting to see. I'd love to go ahead and check that out. They see be careful. Oh boy, are we going to talk about this? And I certainly have not got anything that is going to help portray this nonsense at some point soon. Uh, cue teaser things. Oh god. Yeah, so uh, this is a very famous moment in Hive history that has basically been memorialized here in Savathun's throne world. Uh, for those of you who didn't play the Taken King, and for those of you who are new to Destiny, this is Oryx, or as he was in that moment, Auryx, fighting against one of the five worm gods. Now, most of you who've played Destiny from the beginning will think four worm gods, not five, but no, there were originally five, and the reason there is now four is because Oryx kills this worm god. He kills Akka, the Worm of Secrets. And from Akka, he gains the power to commune with the Deep, aka the Darkness. And it's from that first communion that Oryx becomes the Taken King. Changes from Alryx to Oryx, gives himself a new title, and appropriately so because he has an entirely new power, which is the ability to create Taken which we're not entirely sure how the process works, but the best guess is that any being, such as these Hive Thralls, can be abducted and sent to stand before the darkness. They are then hollowed out, husked and corrupted, and sent back as a more perfect reflection of the darkness, the sword logic, and the final shape. All a bunch of complicated words, but basically uh, they get takenated, as the Bungie devs would say. They become infused with darkness. It's very scary. The fact that Savathun is memorializing this moment I think is a really important note. And the reason I say that is because the Worm Gods are the reason that the Hive are bound to darkness in the first place. If you take the Hive and you take away the Worm Gods, they are no longer the genocidal, destructive people that they have ended up being. And I think as well that it's key to note that they are no longer bound by their worms to the darkness. And so you've got this really powerful moment and this really powerful notion that Savathun here is honoring directly this defiance against darkness. And ultimately, it's kind of ironic that she's doing this in the first place, because Oryx attacking and destroying the Worm God is actually a moment where it's a reverence of darkness. But in this moment, I think Savathun is perhaps 
memorializing it because it's the first time where someone within the Osmium dynasty, their family, really stood up and challenged the status quo that the Worm Gods and therefore Darkness had to be the one that controlled them. You know, it's a very different kind of means of memorializing that because Oryx was trying to become more powerful in the sword logic by doing this. But ultimately, this moment here, really important in Hive history. Very much something that I, yeah, I, I, I can't wait for you guys to see Dynasty because again, this is a scene that as you just got teased, we are making and oh boy, let me tell you, eh, I'm very excited for you all to see it. Also, I mean, it's, it's a little detail and whatnot, but can we also acknowledge that they even have the original, like, Oryx's Willbreaker, his sword, is cast here. Which is very unique, because most Hive Cleavers are not at all unique, but Oryx's sword, it's it's got its own model, it's unique in itself. Like, this is just gorgeous. Environmental storytelling like this. Yeah, I don't know. If they have something akin to the, uh, the patrols that you have in the Dreaming City that allow you to learn more about the world. I hope that all of the equivalents for them in Savathun's Throne World direct to this statue, or well, most of them do, because there is so much context we could learn, and this is a really cool moment. Anyway, let's continue. Be careful. Yet again, we've got more of these symbols here. If I'm not mistaken, the 8259 is something to do with Mercury, not the planet, the element. Uh, and again, maybe this is Osmium. Osmium, again, could be a reference to the elements, and, well, not the element, it would be, I believe, a compound, because I don't think Osmium is an element. I'm not sure. Point being, uh, it could also be a reference to Osmium Dynasty, which is the family of Sabathun, Oryx, and Shivu Arath. So we see all the different biomes here, and I'm actually going to go through this frame by frame. Yes, to that one YouTube commenter from last time. I do realize that I can go ahead and just click forward and back arrows to go ahead and do things frame by frame, or roughly frame by frame. Uh, we're going to talk about this. This aesthetic here does not look like it's a part of the throne world itself. This looks as though it is very much reverential towards the darkness. You have this dark alabaster, which is very similar to the original like base um, skin of Divinity, the exotic that is very much built out of some material from darkness. You have a literal pyramid here. Not at all indicative of anything. Uh, the thing that's not explained or quite so well understood are these kind of green and yellow blocks, but it is kind of similar to something else that we see, which is actually the crafting aspect that they showed off very early on within the trailers for Witch Queen at the reveal. So this looks as though it may be a part of the pyramid, but I feel as though within the pyramid we're also going to get access to whatever mechanism we use in the process of crafting new weapons. And of course this is going to be the pathway towards crafting the glaive. But this aesthetic alone, this lighting, uh, just even down to the dark stone that's really polished and has all of this sort of embossing and embedding on it, it, it screams pyramid. And of course, we also have the other environments within Savathun's throne world. We have the sort of dark, swampy areas, which here looks as though it's transitioning into the really nasty volcanic caverns and whatnot. You have all the uh, verdant growth that's coming along with it, which is a little creepy and terrifying. And then, of course, you have what I'm going to refer to as the upper city, which is, of course, right beneath uh, the shadow of Savathun's great basin here. I don't know what the heck we're supposed to call this, but... It's, uh, it's definitely going to be the looming structure that holds over the entire thing. All very different locations packed into a single biome, which I think is really quite exciting. Let's take a little bit look at a bit more. And again, we have this, which reveals... Jumping platforms! Uh, in the vague proximity of all this terrifying nonsense. Um, again, I think this is going to be one of these mechanics, a little bit like Ascendance in the Dreaming City that you get from a Tincture of Queensfoil, and I think if it's not going to be crucial to the story, at very least you're going to be using it to find and explore quite a few secret areas, which is exciting. Really cool stuff here, before we get to the big reveal. Uh, this, 
Oh, wow, blinding light there, my apologies. This is, of course, a new part of Void 3.0. I don't know why the uh, Void barricade here from the shield is going to be any different, but it's exciting to see that it is. Maybe this is something that just purely is a stronger barricade. If that's the case, kind of basic, but, I mean, certainly not unwelcome, especially in master raid scenarios. I feel like there's actually a real use for that. If ever you've done a DPS phase on Atheon and you've been sitting there getting pounded by harpies from the left that have just spawned and are all in attack mode, you'll know that even inside a well, even when you have lots of defensive buffs, your entire fire team can very quickly just get gunned down. Which is uh, not pleasant, but still. Uh, yeah, exciting things. And of course, another look at a Hive Knight Guardian, which again is using Void Light too. Also, cool weapons. We have the alchemical symbols all over this titan's armor. Uh, yeah, more on this at some point, but remember the fact that it's on the armor too. We've even got the uh, symbols for chemicals too. Um, specific chemicals. I believe this is... Oh god. Someone's going to correct me in the comments here. In fact, I'm not even going to say it. Tell me what this is in the comment section as far as elements are concerned. Tell me what the relevance of some of the numbers is as far as chemistry is concerned. Because I know this, for example, has got to be a compound or a salt or something. But yeah, uh, I'm not a chemist. Tell me, oh honored guest. Don't you want to escape? This... So, where do we begin? Uh, a proper look at Savathun. Something rather terrifying. Uh, I think I want to go ahead and note just a few things here, particularly about Savathun's appearance, which I don't know if I've covered before. Uh, the wings, as best we know, were not necessarily part of Savathun's original appearance. And that's really significant. The reason for that is partly because of what they are. They are moth wings, and that represents something. Currently, the thing that Savathun is encased within is called a chrysalis. In other words, the cocoon that a caterpillar will encase itself in before it's turned into either a moth or a butterfly. Exciting, because it represents a literal metamorphosis from Savathun as a being of darkness into Savathun as a being of light. But also, there is an element to which this draws very heavily from the iconography of death that the Hive are very familiar with and use a lot. And the reason I say that is because if you go back to the Dreadnought and you've done the King's Full Raid, remember Golgoroth's cellar? There were actually a ton of moths floating throughout the air, and I think if you go ahead and look around, there's even certain artifacts that you could get back in Destiny 1 that specifically mentioned moths. The symbology for that was supposed to be around the Hive and their relationship with death. Moths represent dead things. Savathun here is kind of distorting the analogy for a moth here, using it as an analogy for metamorphosis in this case, which is generally speaking what I think a moth or a butterfly would sort of be understood as in most general terms, but in the hive terms, not so much. They've been much less a symbol of rebirth for the hive and much more a symbol of death and the association that life kind of needs to feed off of it. Uh, it's really kind of terrifying to see her make three versions of herself as well. Needless to say, these are apparitions, but I wonder whether there is some kind of mechanic. I can't speak, apparently. I wonder whether there's some kind of mechanic that allows these to appear. I look at these and I can't help but remind myself of the Shades of Oryx, which, if you didn't play the Taken King campaign, were basically dark specters of Oryx, which would appear at certain points in the campaign, which effectively were his eyes and ears that he could see through and use to sort of conquer the system from his Dreadnought without actually stepping out of it. They were the sort of remote arms of Oryx that reached out and were fighting things like Guardians or other enemies that were not yet taken. Certain forces amongst the Taken were commanded directly by the Shades of Oryx, and it's also one of these things of when we defeat Oryx in the campaign, his Shades continue to haunt our world, and there's actually an entire sequence, the sort of second act of the Taken King before we finish it all up in the uh, raid of the Taken King of King's Fall, and that entire arc of it is known as the Taken War. And the reason is because Oryx's shades have descended across the many worlds of the Sol system. 
such as Mars and Earth and Venus and even, you know, smaller planetoids like Phobos, which we go and revisit, which is where the Taken King campaign begins. And all of these shades are here in these locations, commanding different forces trying to capture key assets. And so it makes me wonder if by some mechanism, Savathun has done something similar. Now, make no mistake, the shades are tied to darkness, and they're partly there through mechanisms of darkness, of Oryx trying to allow himself to become closer to death in itself, to become almost analogous to it, to make himself like an axiom of death. It's one of these moments where Savathun would create these copies of herself, these visions, through some power that's very different. Because again, none of this is probably done through the sword logic. These are machinations of hive magic and the light. And I don't know if it's necessarily tied into the darkness anymore. It's definitely one of these moments where you have to look at this and realize that even though she's wielded the light for a minuscule amount of time compared to the rest of us, she is in this strange place where suddenly she is able to do things that we've never even dreamed of or imagined. So yeah, interesting. One last possibility. I wonder if there's anything that Osiris had to do with this, not in the sense that he directly aided her, but consider that Savathun possessed Osiris and basically took control of him and his mind and his body for several months, almost a year. Imagine for a second the kind of havoc that she could basically bring about if she was able to pull the knowledge of creating something like, say, I don't know, a reflection. Just an idea. Total headcanon at the moment, so definitely not confirmed. But yeah, let's we'll see what's going on here. This throne world is indistinguishable from my own mind, Guardian. So, where do we begin with that sentence? This throne world is indistinguishable from my own mind, Guardian. Uh, which not only explains why we might be seeing a giant apparition of Savathun's head up in the top, but also gives us a wholly complete idea of how dangerous Savathun's throne world is. She later says that every single bullet fired and every single step taken, she records them all and she counts them all. And it's definitely one of these moments in which you can sit there and say that while we're in this place, we are very much under her thumb. This is in line with what you should expect entering a throne world. You are very much in a domain where you need to respect the rules of the one who created it. And those rules are not necessarily aligned with darkness anymore, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it isn't dangerous. Savathun effectively knows everything about what we're doing here, which makes me think that we are going to fall into her traps without even necessarily trying, because it's going to be one of the only options that we have available. The only thing that we can do is hope that she somehow underestimates us, perhaps. And if that is the case, well, then maybe she really hasn't learned her lesson from the season of the Splicer. If anybody has over and over farmed the, uh, corrupted Tartarus, I believe it is, uh, yeah, from season of the Splicer, it's, it's one of those moments at which you get Osiris saying, I won't underestimate you again. But of course, that is Savathun saying that. So we'll have to go ahead and see. There are some very interesting moments in this trailer as well. You see constantly this kind of strange coloration of this portal here. This, I believe, is going to be transitory and is going to allow us to go deeper into the throne world through various different bits and parts. It's also something which we've seen earlier in the trailer, but I didn't know if it was quite worth pointing out. What I'd also go ahead and say is there's something strange going on here. We've got... A little buddy. Take a look at that. Some strange pyramid-like structure. Clearly it has the aesthetics and motifs of the darkness. It is not much like the hive stuff. It is in contrast to it. And again, I think that contrast only denotes further that Savathun has aligned herself with the power of the light at very least, even though she is definitely still our enemy. But you can't say that this is of the same architecture when it is dark as obsidian and the hive stuff around it is uh, very clearly not. So yeah, this also looks like it's being escorted by these guardians. I don't know if this is something where it's a sort of momentary quest, but if we just go ahead and replay this clip really quickly, you can see that there's a little bit of movement on this thing. What this is, I have no idea. Maybe it's part of a public event, maybe it's something in the story. We will have to wait and find out, honestly. This is a hive ghost, of course, and uh, it looks as though this might be one of those first moments in which we actually discover something to do with the hive 
and then being able to resurrect it, because again, lo and behold, look, it's a dead hive knight, which, of course, if you're looking at a ghost, even potentially a damaged one, they might be able to resurrect them. I'm not entirely sure what's happened to allow this one ghost to lose a part of its shell, this sort of upper left limb here that we'd be looking at, but either way, uh, it's something worth looking at and thinking every about. Every step taken. Every bullet fired. I keep and count them all. So, uh, for those of you who didn't catch the reference, yes, this is very much a Thor Ragnarok kind of moment. Uh, if you don't, if you haven't seen the movie and you've not seen the uh, final fight. Uh, yeah, go ahead and take a look at that, and maybe you'll understand uh, why Bungie's cinematography team, when it comes to building these trailers out, is so dang good. So good. Um, also worth talking about this kind of architecture here. It doesn't speak to me as architecture that is exactly the same as what's going on above. It's kind of weird and different in a certain sense. You know, you're looking at something which speaks much more as far as the vibes of the Pyramid are concerned. And of course, the presence of Scorn here seems to only highlight further that something isn't quite the same. You have Scorn iconography, of course, all over the place, and the actual Scorn themselves are going to be an interesting symbol of the fact that something is going on here, but I think this is indicative of the fact that the Darkness is trying to actively invade the Throne World too. Scorn would not be welcome here. Only the Lucent Brood of Savathun would be welcome. And I don't think that we'd be looking at something where we would see Taken either, because of course, Savathun by this point has lost control of them. So if you see either of those two groups of forces, it seems very much like they are going to be aligned against Savathun. And as we can see by the fact that we're fighting them, not necessarily too happy with us either. It's really strange too, seeing this as like a built-up structure. And it makes me wonder, for starters, how long has the pyramid been there? And also, have some of these structures been there the whole time and then been progressively abandoned as Savathun has turned to the light? If so, it might be a really interesting idea as to why the pyramid is there in the first place. Something which becomes even more interesting as you sit there and you have that line about how Savathun's throne world is something where she's able to count every bullet and every footstep and she thinks about and records them all, you know. These are interesting questions that still need to be answered, but the environment telling a story itself might be an interesting concept here. If that's all true, you could sit there and see the pyramid ship as being run down as proof of Savathun having abandoned the power of the darkness and having sort of almost like a child that has grown up, left their toys all over their room and sort of forgotten to tidy them away and doesn't really care about them anymore, has left them in disrepair, maybe thrown them away, and just hasn't taken the rubbish out yet. Something along those lines. It's, yeah, it's really interesting to see all of this. But again, all headcanon, all speculative, we can't know for sure until we're Every actually... bullet fired. I keep and count them all. It's not too late to turn around. <laughs> Can we just acknowledge for a second that it is mildly terrifying to see, for starters, a, a, a cadre of Hive Guardians, Knight, Wizard, and Acolyte, you know, representing quite clearly Hunter, Warlock, and Titan, but also Savathun just casually throwing an overbomb. That's, you know, I'm, I'm very used to being the one that does that move, and having it used against me is not something I'm looking forward to. Yeah, not good. Uh... To say it's mildly terrifying is an understatement at that, I think. Uh, also, take a note, this bell here, this is at the top of the spire. Uh, the, in the very top of this basin type thing. And it's actually what our guardians are running underneath here. So it would appear that if we're going to have a big fight with Savathun at some point, or if there's going to be a rather large moment in the story campaign, we may be looking at that fight taking place up here, in this place where she originally resurrected a bunch of Hive as Hive Guardians, in this place where she's really coalesced all her power. It's not entirely clear, but this I think is going to be an important moment in the story, only made more important by the fact that a full fire team of Hive Guardians is standing here and is ready to fight. Something very, very cool like that going down. Ooh, I'd love to go ahead and see this.
Man, you just can't beat a villain with an amazing cackle. That's just... Oh, God, that's so good. Um, also, something of note. Osteostriga is the name of this SMG here, which is very hive looking in a lot of its construction, and, yeah, kind of nasty. Striga, if I'm not mistaken, is uh, a, another word in a different language for witch weed, and if I'm remembering Osteo correctly, it's something to do with combination. I'm not entirely sure about either of those, but hopefully from that you'll be able to go ahead and figure it out uh, vaguely what the sort of combination of words is implying about the weapon. If you want more of a definitive answer for when the time comes, Osteostriga might have an entry on Rhino's Twitter. If you don't know him, basically, he takes items within Destiny and he breaks down the meaning of their names and their flavor text. Um, so, you know, for example, if you wanted to go ahead and learn about the old Destiny 1 ship called the Classic Russian Soul, he breaks down what the quote-unquote Russian Soul kind of analogy is supposed to imply and what it means, you know, all sorts of things like that. And of course, you know, it wouldn't be a hive-themed thing without a bunch of runes being pointed out here, whether it's stolen, reciprocal, you know, uh, ascended, greater, nonsense, all this jazz here. This is a really cool emote. I really want to grab that. Anyway, uh, point being, this is looking very interesting. There are tidbits of the trailer where, of course, we are going to need more context to unravel it. I think if there's something which I'm really looking forward to, I mean, clear highlights, obviously, this place, wherever this is, I feel like there's going to be a ton of story nonsense going on here. I'd love to just sit and figure out what's going on in this particular moment. Um, also, of course, when we finally do get to that top ascent, when we get to here, I think expect a really important moment in the story. Something which I believe is going to really be the pinnacle of it all. Looking forward to this. It's going to be exciting. And hopefully we get a lot more out of Witch Queen and uh, we see more trailers in the coming days. I especially think there are things that they've got to talk about which just makes sense. Whether that's something like crafting and how that's going to work, or whether it's another breakdown of Savathun as a villain. Expect more content on Destiny, and also some upcoming Warframe content potentially in the next few days, because, uh, yeah, I'm getting back on the bandwagon with regards to creating content. Also, if you enjoyed that little teaser of Dynasty that we did uh, some way into the video, then, uh, yeah. We'll have more to talk about at some point soon. I'm going to figure out when we're actually going to drop the next dev diary. We uh, are doing that much later than anticipated, but that's okay because ultimately production is still very much on schedule and it's one of these moments at which we just probably had to go ahead and change things around and yeah, I was not necessarily in the immediate place to do all of that at once. Uh, I'll be talking about more video stuff and things like this in an upcoming day. I can't even speak. In an upcoming more candid video, there we go, uh, which allows me to go ahead and just give you guys the lowdown on what's going on, and hopefully that will give you a briefing of what's going to happen between now and Witch Queen, and hopefully we get to talk about some cool content. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Again, let me know what you think in the comment section down below. Talk to me about things, tell me about the chemical symbols, tell me about all of that, because I'm pretty sure I've seen things here and there, but I have no idea of what to confirm. Uh, any chemists out there will be able to tell me much better. All of that being said, as per usual, know that your viewership is quite enough for me, and that in the meantime, my name has been, my name is Bife, Porodasia Arastra. I'll see you, Starside.